Jay, good morning. How are you, my man? Good. How about you, Robert? How are you doing? I'm doing uh, very well. So what was the motivation for writing this book? Was it because your father... At the end of his career and the end of his life, ultimately, unfortunately, um, was embroiled in that scandal. And, and that's sort of the when you you didn't want that to be the last memory of your father, Joe Paterno. Well, a little bit of that. I mean, I started out writing about what it was like to be in the middle of one of these media. Uh, you know, you see these throngs of media that show up at all. the You know, whether it's Ferguson, Missouri, whether it's Roger Goodell, whether it's what happened here. Yeah. And being inside of one of those and looking out, it's, uh, it is surreal. And I started writing about that. But then as I wrote, I realized there were a lot of lessons, you know, my, from my dad that I learned, the players learned, that people learned from him that I wanted to share. So I wanted the book to be about, a, you know, really what he accomplished in his life in terms of as an educator and a coach. And, and that's where it developed into. What was it like being in the eye of that storm? Because I've wondered that myself. Uh, in big, huge news stories like that, what are the players involved? I'm not talking about football players. I mean, the, right. you know, the family and that kind of stuff. Uh, there was a, uh, yeah, a famous case here where three girls were uh, kidnapped and held for 10 years. And, of course, that's a huge international media sensation. And you can only imagine what it must be like to be one of the parties involved in something like that. What was it like for you and your father during that time? Well, I mean, it's total chaos. Every, you know, we were in the middle of a football season trying to coach and get to practice. And there were people climbing through the bushes to film practice. And, you know, every time my dad left his house, there were 150, 200 people there. I'd go over there. You know, I went over there one night with my kids to have dinner. And I had to get out and ask them just to respect the privacy of my kids. Uh, which they did, to their credit. Um, but, you know, it's every minute a story breaks on social media and you're reacting constantly. And it is like you, you, you can tell you're in it, you can't even fathom what a wild ride it is and how you have to react constantly. And it's, uh, it turns everything you know completely on its head. Uh, what was your father's demeanor uh, during that period of time? How did he take this? Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're with him at, at his house or at practice or whatever, or, or in private moments, uh, was he angry at what was happening was he just sort of like well we'll ride with it how, how was he he was kind of focused he said look let's get ready for this next game um you know he said we have jobs to do and regardless of how many people are across the street or trying to get on the you know get into the building where we work and everything we've got to stay focused for the guys that we coach and ultimately they fired him before the next game but you know I remember some people complaining. He said, look, you know, don't blame the people across the street and the media members. He said, they got an editor that's sold them either. They got families they got to support and they've got jobs they got to do. They're there because they have to be there. So don't be mad at them. Just understand that we have to work around it. And, uh, you know, I'm looking, I'm going, you know, I'm pissed. I mean, can I say that? I'm sure, the- sure. <laughs> I said, look, I'm mad. He goes, look, don't be mad at them. That's just the reality of the situation. He was pretty calm about the whole thing. Um, but you know that comes with years of experience, and he's been in the you know been the public eye for sixty years at that point in his life. So he he was remarkably calm about it when a lot of other people weren't. You know, I I uh, didn't really follow Penn State football much. Your father died after this whole scandal broke. He died just a couple of months later, right? Yeah, it was about uh, this thing broke in November, and he died in. Uh, late January, mid to late January, and it happened pretty quickly. And, you know, we had no idea that he had cancer. And after he got fired, about three days later, um, he was coughing up blood and had never had any problems. And to get him out of the house, you know, the garage door was shut. He went down into the garage, got on the floor of the backseat of my sister's car. They put kind of a blanket over him. They opened the garage. My sister acted like she had just come out of the house to get in her car and drove away so nobody would see him leaving to go to the hospital and get some x-rays. And about two days later, we found out that there was a tumor in his, in his lung, and that was, you know, what acceler- you know, accelerated, and that was ultimately what caused him to die. But that's the kind of thing you had to do just to go to see a doctor. I mean, Jay, can I be crazy. honest with you? I, I remember at the time, of course, we talked about it. Every show, every media outlet in the world talked about uh, what was going on out there. When I first heard that when the report came out, oh, he has cancer, I go, ah, BS. They're just, they must have known about this before. They're trying to get sympathy for Joe Paterno. That's what I thought. I think a lot of people thought that. Right. But, no, we had no idea. In fact, I'll tell you, his doctor went back after my dad died. His doctor, my dad had had some uh, pneumonia over the course of 
you know, when you get to be a certain age, I mean, it's like everybody gets the money at some point. But that summer, before all this happened, he he had gone in for some chest X-rays um, to see if the pneumonia was clear and whole nine yards. And the doctor went back after my dad had died and looked, and there was not a single sign of anything on and the X-ray. It, wow, it happened that know. quickly, huh? It happened that quickly. We, we were stunned. I mean, was like, he a, a smoker? Do you think that's what led to it? or no, what? No. He never smoked. And, oh, you know, wow. he walked... The summer before he died, he was walking seven, eight miles a day at age 84 right. uh, at a very, very high pace. And a friend of mine, you know, my dad's four miles from, three and a half miles from the house. My friend sees him. Oh, he says, hey, your dad out here walking around. I said, yeah. He goes, you know, it's 92 degrees outside. <laughs> he goes, yeah, you tell him to stop. <laughs> do you think that... Um do you think that after this scandal, so he's diagnosed with this cancer, I don't know how bad it was, if it was just completely so bad, obviously it killed him in a couple of months, but do you think that because of the scandal that maybe he, would he have fought through it more, do you think, if, if that hadn't been going on? No, I think he tried, you know, he tried, to, you know, up until about the last nine days, it looked like the tide was kind of turning in his favor. Mm-hmm. And then uh, about nine days before he died, it started to go the other way. And it was just, it was just overwhelming everything they were trying to do to stop it. So, but, you know, I've had people say, do you think this kill, you know, the scandal thing? So I said, no, I said, you know, you know, and my dad would be the first one to say, no, I mean, you know, what certain things happen in life and, and God's got his plan and he's going to kind of follow it. And, uh, and it, what happens happens. And uh, it was, it, no, you know, he was 85 years old, so it wasn't like I feel like I got gypped out of years with, with my dad. Yeah. I, mean, I was fortunate to have him as long as I did and to work with him for 17 years. So, I'm not, you know, I don't sit here and complain about what I don't have with him. I, and, and the other thing, I think that when someone dies of like this um, and you know the end is coming, you don't leave anything unsaid. And I think that's, that's oh, you know, I look at that as a true benefit. There were things that have been nothing that I said. I wish I had said this to him before he went. Was he... Uh, uh was tell me what kind of guy he was because oftentimes you think of these tough old football coaches as uh, pretty pretty hard you know uh, pretty uh, not real emotional uh, how was he with you guys uh, with children was he an affectionate father um, was he or was he one of these guys that didn't say I love you a lot. Um, you know, it all, he was he was affectionate, but he was also very much uh, he didn't get overly emotional about things. He was very even keeled. I think that's why he was as successful coaching as he was. You know, he never got too excited after a win, and never got too down after a loss because he realized, you know, the margin between success and, and failure is not that is not that big. And he felt the way with his kids. You know, he, you know, if you got you know if you got a ninety eight on a test, which that's more my sister than me to be totally frank with you. But you know, if you got a ninety seven on a test or a ninety eight, you'd say what happened to the other two or three uh, percent? That was the challenge all the time. And he always was. You know, he was he would be the you know he never tossed a swim. But if he's that type of father that oh just swim to me, and while you're swimming, they sneak a step or two back, you know, make you go further than you thought you could. I mean, that's how he was all the time. But he was you know he was a great father, and he was a um, but he was demanding. I mean, he had he had very high standards, and uh, you know, there, there was a wooden paddle, and there was a belt in the house, which was you know if you if you disrespected my mom or you did something that threaten your own personal safety that's when you got really got into trouble with them uh, and there's a story in the book i talked about i had really done something talked back to my mom and said some things to her i never should have said and my dad said go get my belt so i go over into his closet he's got like 40 belts and i find a little <laughs> cotton preppy belt with it but it's not a, <laughs> you, that you would get you know in a pair of khaki shorts right. in the 1970s and he laughed so hard that he ended up not really punishing me but you know it was like <laughs> hey, you're pretty smart yeah you'd be the option you pick out the one that won't hurt so speaking of this uh you know uh, of this corporal punishment that your dad would sometimes dole out to you with a belt what do you think of this adrian peterson thing what he did to his four-year-old son uh over the top or is this acceptable well, I'm not even going to touch that one except to say, you know, I think, you know, I think the thing that we've gotten to, we have to be very careful that before we really judge people, that everybody gets the full story. You know what I mean? And I don't know enough about Adrian Peterson to even comment on it. But that said, you know, when I see what's going on with Roger Goodell, I mean, we're spending more time talking about Roger Goodell than we do Ray Rice and domestic violence anymore. And I think we got to be careful that, you know, you know, you know, same thing with this. You know, we talk more about 
the people that are, you know, we don't talk about the people who commit the crimes. We talk about the next big target we can get associated with it, the tangent to it. You know, uh, you know, and, and I've known Jim Tressel a long time. And you know, when you look at what happened at Ohio State with the tattoos, you know, all of a sudden we're vilifying. You know, you know, Jim Tressel was the one that went and got free tattoos. I mean, mm-hmm. and not that I think that's a, you know, a huge crime or whatever, but. You know, you spend time talking about guys that didn't do certain things that rather than the people who did. And I think, that, you know, and so I don't want to get the Adrian Peterson thing. And, and that, you know, the truth will all come out over time. And and that's certainly what I hope will happen as it relates to my dad with, with this case. And I think it is. Well, he was vilified in, in that case or the Jerry Sandusky thing because many people said, well, he should have done more, and just a, a quick 30-second primer for people who don't uh, remember exactly what happened, and you can correct me if I get anything wrong, Jay, because it's been quite some time since I've even talked about it. Uh, you know, one of this guy, uh, I think it was McQueary, went to your father and said, hey, I just saw, this is, I think in 2001, I just saw some, some strange sexual behavior going on in the shower between Jerry Sandusky and a 10-year-old boy, or however old the boy was. Uh, he told that to your father. Your father then uh, uh, reported that to the athletic director or whoever it was. Uh, and people have said that he he should have followed up. And some people, including the former director of the FBI, who did an investigation after the fact, claimed, look, San, uh, uh, Paterno knew more about uh, Sandusky than he uh, let on, that there was a previous thing in 1998. Paterno said he didn't know anything about it. He knew that there were prior allegations, so he should have really been on alert when this latest thing came up. Um, and that was the criticism, and, and uh, continues to be the criticism of your father, Joe. Uh, what is your side of the story, or what would be his side of the story if he were still here? Well, I think what people have to understand is this. Number one, uh, the, the report put out by the FBI director, Louis Free, did not have access to all the information, did not have subpoena power, did not have all the evidence. And what the prosecutors in this case, who looked at all the evidence, had all the – they interviewed all the witnesses. Free, by his own admission, didn't interview all the key people in the case because he didn't have subpoena power. Um, so basically what the prosecutors have said was Joe was forthcoming. He was honest. He was cooperative. He reported it. And he in no way attempted to conceal or cover this up. Now, now to me, that's end of story. I mean, he, he followed the law. He reported it. He didn't try and cover it up. He did what he's, you know, did exactly what the law tells you to do. Now that said, I understand where people say, oh, well, he should have done more, should have followed up. The truth of the matter is, uh, we're not 100% sure that he didn't call Tim Curley, the athletic director, afterwards and say, hey, where is that thing at? Uh, you know, but that said, you know, the NCAA has put out guidelines which basically say coaches are not to follow up on these kind of allegations, whether it's by, you know, whether it's committed by a student athlete or a staff member. Um, the, the protocol that's now in place is exactly what Joe did. And I think one of the things you understand is the other thing about being a guy like Joe Paterno, people say he's the most powerful guy, he should have done this. He was also wary of picking up the phone and calling the police and saying, what's going on? Because you can't do it anyway. It's illegal for him to call the police and say, where's this investigation going? Because there's an integrity to an investigation that has to be respected. And also he was wary of, he didn't want all of a sudden the police to say, hey, Joe wants us to bury this. That's why he called. Or... You know, if if Joe makes that call and there's a record of him making that call and Jerry's never charged, what does that look like? It looks like, well, Joe made a call. So he was very, very wary of doing that. However, he reported the crime. And I think one thing that's very important, like you said, he was vilified. Uh, we have to be very, very careful that we don't vilify people who report crimes. I mean, he didn't witness it. He didn't commit a crime. He was given a report by someone and and went to the athletic director and the head of campus police. The guy oversaw the campus police. So this was reported to police. It was also reported outside the university to the second mile. And people got to remember, Jerry didn't work at the university at the time this happened. So there's all kinds of complicating factors in this. But the ultimately, at the end of the day, if Joe wanted to cover it up, he would have just hired Mike McQuarrie on the spot and said, don't ever talk about this ever again. He wouldn't bring 14, 15, 16 people into this thing. Hey, hey Jay, uh, yeah. Jay Paterno is on with us. He is the son of uh, legendary coach Joe Paterno. And Jay, a uh, coach as well, played uh, for, for uh, football himself. Jay did. Um, in that time that we were talking about, that, that, that eye of the storm, this media frenzy that was surrounding that, 
Did your father ever say to you, you know what, I, I did what I was required by law. I, I did what I thought was right at the time. Do you think he had any misgivings about it or, or second thoughts, I guess, wishing he could have done more? Because in hindsight, obviously, Jerry Sandusky was a big creep. And when this was reported to your father in 2001, he continued to abuse children for many, many years after that. Did your father ever say anything to you along those lines of, you know, I, I did what I thought was right at the time. But boy, you know what? I wish I would have I wish I would have done more. Or I wish I could have done something else. Well, he said, he, he, when he announced his retirement, he said, given the, with the benefit of hindsight, I wish I would have done more. And what he was saying is, look, you know, and, and I'll tell you what he told me privately, but what he was essentially saying is, you know, I'm, to, I'm totally unaware that this kind of thing, even, you know, this, this, this is a guy who lived his life very, very straight and narrow. And the idea that someone would be attracted to young people was so foreign to him. Um because you know, the guy was 80, you know, when this was reported, he was in his late 70s. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, Jay, you know, I just, you know, I just thought people like this, you know, just like I did growing up. When I, was, when I grew up, you know, you were taught about people that were a danger to you or a guy in a uh, white van trying to get you in a car <laughs> with candy. I mean, yeah. you know, at a playground. That's what you thought the threat was. You didn't think it would be somebody you knew and had known for many years who was a church going, non drinking, married, guy who started a statewide charity to benefit kids. I mean, you know, I mean, that's what we knew about him. Yeah. And so when this report came across his desk, he was floored. So it was hard for him to grasp. And he said to me one time, he said, you know, Jay, if this kind of stuff had gone on when I was growing up in Brooklyn um, in, you know, in the 30s, nobody would have talked about it. They, some people from the men's neighborhood were taking the guy out and beating him within an inch, within an inch of his life, and no one would have known why. Um, and it would have been taken care of. He said, not that that's how we should do it now. He goes, but we just didn't, we had no grasp. And, and, and by his own admission, he said, when this report came to him, he goes, I knew I did, had no idea how to handle this. I was completely out of my element on this because, you know, I wasn't trained in this. And so he said, I looked at the university policy, which is formulated by state law. And I said, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I called the people and report to the guys I was supposed to do. And with the understanding that they would take this thing and take care of it. And, so, oh, you know, he said, you know, what he was saying is, you know, yeah, I wish I would have been aware of something 10 years earlier, five years earlier, five months earlier, and would have known what we were dealing with. Uh, and, he, you know, he was one of those people who always blamed himself on those things. How well did you yeah, know Jerry Sandusky? I've known since the time I was born, basically. Did, did, mean, did, know, was there any, at hindsight being 2020, was there anything now that you look back and you go, yeah, that guy, I mean, I should have, I should have been aware that this guy was a creepy pedophile. No, I mean, that's the thing. I'd still rack my brain and go, was there anything that I might have missed or seen? Or, I mean, just to give you some perspective, I mean, I've known him all my life, and he adopted six kids. So he went into the state courts and adopted six children and had foster kids put in his home all the time. So when you saw him around a kid, you know, it was generally one of the foster kids that had been put in his home. So you would assume that the state agencies that are evaluating his home on a constant basis you know, they know a lot more than we did about these kinds of issues, and they missed it. And so, you know, I really wish that, you know, I'm, I'm like my dad. I mean, I wish to God there would have been something that I could have seen or, like, triggered something. You know, and I compare it to, you know, when you go to New York City after 9-11, there's the signs everywhere that say, if you see something, say something. Yeah. Um, we know what to look for. Like, if somebody leaves a car running in Times Square and no one's around, you know that's not... You know, that's something you're looking for. With this crime, with these types of crimes, most of us have no idea what to look for when it comes to nice guy offenders. And, you know, I hope, you know, one of the things my dad says, you know, if, in the silver lining of all this, of what's happened here and happened to me and all my yards is, you know, maybe some good will come out of us and maybe we'll be awareness of this issue. And, and he's right about that because, you know, I have five kids of my own, you know. My granddaughter was, uh, my, not my granddaughter, she my dad's granddaughter. My daughter uh, was on the same time soccer team as Jerry Sandusky's daughter, and she was at a birthday party at his house, so we didn't know. We had no clue. When you when, when Sandusky went on TV with Bob Casas, did that interview, w what the hell did you guys think? Because that was, I mean, that well, was... We were so in the middle of getting ready for a game, so we didn't even know what was going on. We had no idea, so we didn't see it. You know, we were in a film, you know, we were in a film session watching practice tape, Get film or video now. I'm sorry, show my age. Video and you know we're watching the the, the video from the practice. We had no idea. I read about it the next day. 
<laughs> yeah, crazy. Like, what? You know, I mean, I was like, what? like I don't, I'm like, I don't. What is a lot of, you know? Why would a lawyer let him do that? I don't know. But you know, that's, you know, those are all legal things. I have no idea. But we totally missed it. And I still haven't really heard it. You you played uh, coach under. I mean, you played uh, football there under your father, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, look, I didn't play much. I knew I, you know, I knew there was no NFL career in my future, but I enjoyed the game. I knew I wanted to coach at some point, and uh, you know. In football, there's a scout team, and you simulate the other team's plays and take your lumps. And uh, I learned the game. Um, I didn't realize how many people in the team really wanted to hit my dad, uh, but I realized <laughs> that I was the next best substitute. <laughs> I bet, yeah. I took a lot of shots, and, you know, expecting sympathy from my father, I'd get wiped out. You know, guys, you know, all Americans, pros, all that, they'd nail you, you know. And it was good day. She wasn't dirty. And I'd get up expecting some kind of sympathy from my dad, and I'd look over, he'd be laughing. And I'm like, oh, thanks, Dad. You know, thanks for that, you know, shoulder to cry on. What are you uh, What are you doing now? Are you still coaching? I have no idea. What are you, what no, are you... no. I'm, I've been at coach a couple of years, and, and, you know, a lot of this stuff, I've done some consulting, done some political stuff. Um, the book right now is really taking up a lot of time, working on another book. But I think, you know, with the book now being done and doing the media and book signings, i got 20 signings set up, and I'll, there'll be more. Jay, do you think um, it will be hard if you, if you want to get uh, back into coaching, uh, you want to do some college coaching? Do you think that the name Paterno – is that going to hinder any job opportunities that may be afforded to you in the future, do you think? Well, I think there's no question that it has up to this point, but I think we're at a point now where people are starting to get the full narrative of this and they're starting to realize, you know, because, because look, when Louis Free went out and said Joe was part of an effort to conceal uh, Jerry's crimes, which we now know is completely not true, um, because the prosecution, who has all the evidence, has said that was not true. I think there was, you know, there was kind of a, oh, my gosh, you know, how many people knew about it in the whole nine yards. And we've slowly kind of started to push that back um, and people start to understand. But I think this book will help and that this will create kind of a natural pivot point for me to get back into coaching. So, you know, I hope it doesn't. I hope, you know, I think, you know, if people look at what I was able to do as a coach, uh, help kids compete in the classroom at a high level and on the field at a high level. Um, I think that'll speak for itself, and I think there's there's enough good people out there that'll get that. And you know, if I want to get back into coaching at the end of the season, I think that'll that'll happen. Jay Paterno's book is called Paterno Legacy: Enduring Lessons from the Life and Death of My Father. This is available in stores right now. He's been working on it, like he said, for quite some time. Uh, and uh, it sounds pr like a pretty interesting book and, of course, can give you a glimpse of what it would be like to be in the center of all of that uh, kind of stuff going on. Jay, good luck with the book, and uh, and I appreciate you coming on the show, my man. Hey, I appreciate it. You know, I used to recruit out your way in Cleveland. I listened to MMS all the time, and I can remember being young, and uh, when, when Rolling Stone used to have their best rock station in the country, uh, you, I, you guys may not remember this, but Rolling Stone used to have the fans vote on the best rock station in the country. You guys always won. Yes. Um, and then I so, think it know, turned out that they were ended up. I think there was a scandal that MMS was was stuffing the ballot box. I think that turned into oh, a big scandal. That doesn't go on, does it? <laughs> no. You guys still got the buzzer? Uh, what's that? Is the buzzer still the station? Yeah, the it's yeah. They don't really uh, they don't really highlight the buzzard anymore. The the station mascot, but uh, it's still bring back kind the buzzard of buzzard already. Would you bring back the buzzard? Yeah, and and uh, I tell people. Our home station here that we're based at, WMMS, has been a rock station longer than I've been alive, and I'm turning 39 uh, on Sunday. So it's been a rock station almost as long as rock stations have been around. Oh, absolutely. And uh, yeah. it is a great legendary radio station, even for people that are just coming through. And, uh, uh, hey, man, I appreciate those uh, those memories. And, Jay, good luck with this book. And uh, I appreciate Happy the time. On Sunday, oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's when it's all downhill. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. After 40, boy. Oh, boy. That's when it's, that's when it's bad news. I hope I live to be uh, as, as long and tough as uh, your father, uh, running around that. in 90-degree weather when I'm 80. So. Exactly. Jay, hey, I thanks, appreciate guys. it. Thank you. Jay Paterno.